That's right. The red-tailed hawks are having their way with all the young birds this year. How about for you? You're going to be one of those young birds that the red-tailed hawk comes in, swoops in, takes you out, like the cricket you might be. I'm asking you not to be that cricket. I'm asking you to stay away from that. It's not even the eagle that can take you out. When you look at this thing properly, how this is all working out, yeah, they're working at it through their minions. You don't have to see the biggest, baddest bird. Any any predatory bird out there will take you out if you're a cricket. I haven't had to worry about the red-tailed hawk. How about you if you're a cricket? This is BTWRLM317 for those on anybody on past cast, broadcast, past, recast, whatever the cast is. Hopefully not one on your arm or leg. When you re-listen to this for the content, to search it out on the Internet, because I give you the links that you can go to if you want to find something I'm talking about that interests you to delve deeper into and or it becomes part of the thing that you've decided you want to fix and I happen to bring it up because no one really communicates with me on all this stuff. Keep asking. I just want to see how few are responding. I'm not really interested in the in the up up or down thumbs on any of this, these places that you can. I ask just to see if anybody's listening to go do it. There's so few people that will. I, I really don't care about a down thumb. I ask you only if you're going to put a down thumb, whatever down, you know, like something like you're in some some coliseum, and I happen to be the fodder in the in the in the field. In the coliseum, you get to watch me being chewed up by the lions. I don't even get a thumbs up or thumbs down in that regard. The thumbs down, I'd like to have you put a comment in so I know where it is you think I'm wrong instead of just thinking that you're getting away with it. That's just not. That's just another worst type of cricket. Because here's what we have to do. We have to understand each other to move forward so we stop these divisions that are amongst us. And we all think that our little view of the world is the right view and the only way to go. And then no one goes. Because the knowledge apparently is, an, is enough in itself, and it's not, not in the real world. And so today I've got an interesting, I don't do this too much, in particular this case, this time. Um, I've got a court case here that's come up, and I spoke about it in the in the notice to us. And it was that court case relative to the forfeiture. The Supreme Court decided on that case. It was uh, Tim's case in Indiana. And I just passed, uh, I looked through it and I said it's important because they're limiting the forfeiture. And I said, here are your civil rights, your Title 42 civil rights, that right of the government to exact from you every kind of extortion. It's 40, for the, if you haven't heard this before, and you got to stick with me on all this. Anybody that's listening hasn't heard me before or comes through this broadcast before, you have to listen really for a, quite a long time. I understand that. There's no other way I know to do this. But you have to listen for quite a while and keep putting the, the points together for yourself. Hopefully you're reading what I'm saying about and you're getting the points quicker and faster and closer. But uh, I've made lots of statements and comments over the years about how this world do you think it is set up, and it's particularly the government of the United States. They come out of a time when there was a lots of lots of ideas going on. Lots of people have gotten in trouble over those following up on those ideas without really looking at the terrain and taking better cues and better thoughts. But I've made some comments. I've uh, referred to your civil rights being exactions of every kind. That's the that's the code of the United States government. Not even a question. Most people don't even understand what they're reading. A lot of people will go there and not really understand a few people, and this is the people, most likely the people I appreciate the most. They've come away just stunned at what they find out your so-called equal rights are. They're coming out of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. So I've talked to you about all about what Lincoln did to this country and that it changed and all this other stuff. And then this case in Indiana came up, and I told you about it. I didn't really think about it too much more. There's just so much to go that goes on. And what was interesting is my colleagues picked up on it, and they read the, they read the decision. And one comment uh, from one of my colleagues, because he could see, the way we apply this, he could see how this mining law is the thing that they're actually can be talking about if you take away the wrappings of the criminal case, what they're doing to production. And so, if you haven't been following me on some of those tidbits and those nuggets and those points and principles, you may not appreciate what's going on here, but he told me that the civil rights the civil, excuse me, the Civil War was stated in that Indiana case by against Tim's. Where they, he agreed that he had done a, a drug of a, vial, of a drug crime. And uh, anyway, I could read. I'll read the decision. I'll, and and then they took his his SUV, which was 
$30,000 more than the fine. And so he went to the Supreme Court and said, hey, you know, that, that's an excessive fine, isn't it? And the court rendered its uh, decision. And I'd like today uh, to read that. So let's let's get to that. And I want to, uh, if you re- if you listen and read and listen between the lines, if you will, if you read between these lines, applying what I've been telling you. Those of you that that think that you want states' rights, those of you that think that you want to go back to the origin, the original establishment, you've been or going to be into a bit of trouble. It's in it, this again. It's consistent with what I've been telling you. And why I say this is not because I necessarily like it. It's but because it's the reality, actually. And if you don't address the battlefield the way the battlefield is, you're going to get harmed by it. And it doesn't care. It's At minimum, it's amoral. In the next step, it's just outright criminal. And And I don't get into too much semantics about what you want to call it. Just let me know what it does. And then, uh, okay, we'll go from what it does. All right, so we can call it all kinds of things. You can call yourself whatever you are, uh, whatever you want to be. You, you can whatever side of the so-called the political fence you want to be on. It's all irrelevant to the way you're being dealt with. In this case, uh, to my in- exceeding interest, after I was told the Civil War was commented to relative to the Bill of Rights, relative to the Fourteenth Amendment, relative to the state's authority to beat you down, and it acts as a limit, was a very interesting. Um, notice to me that I went back and I read the read the, uh, the case. This is becoming actually so significant. And when you re- listen, and I'll read this. I'm going to read this. It's a small decision. It's only a few pages, uh, 20 pages long, but it's in narrow page. So it'll take a little bit. But when you read, listen between the lines here, you're going to hear about everything I've ever said about this con- this particular condition. And you're going to hear some interesting positions about the limit of the state's authority and what they can't take. And when you listen in between the lines of that, you'll hear what I've been saying about what your property is about and how you discuss it. You don't let the attorney, you don't let the government define you don't have the property that's to be protected. This case has become a very interesting case for us. In fact, we're going to be utilizing this decision for quite a few things. And we've already got a one state, Again, my colleague is working through what he does. He's already got on tap a senator that's going into the, a state and saying, hey, all this legislation is now, Ill, um, this proposed legislation is unlawful because of this decision. And again, you you may or may not understand how to apply what I've been saying about our injunction. Because all of this stuff, remember, let me just point it out here, because you're going to hear it in this re- response. You're going to hear it in this decision. Anything that the government does that's punitive, suffers the prohibition of the Eighth Amendment restriction. This case, listen also carefully, this case agrees. The states can beat you down. But there is that limit I talked to you about when I gave you the notice about reading the the, the law, the report about it, the news about it. So be careful on wrapping your hands too, your arms too tight around this decision. So I've advised my colleague not to do. There's a certain way you could, you have to handle this with kid gloves as well. But listen for the fact that it's not just a criminal attachment. Anything that is punitive in nature is subject to prohibition and subject to the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, the original one. I want to call your attention before we get to reading this. And how to apply what you're reading. Not just read it, listen, and have your eyes roll back. But start applying the world to what you're hearing here. This is how this uh, regime has decided this point. So you have to understand how they're getting at these points so that you can work within that. Because you don't have a power outside of it. That when they say anything punitive is subject to this constraint in the Eighth Amendment. I want to remind you that all your green jobs, all your carbon tax, all your climate change legislation, all your sustainable development type uh, re- conservation restrictions, they're all punitive in uh, by their existence. They're stated to be punitive. And that happens without due process of law, no trial, no decision, no jury, no nothing, not even equity title, nothing. And so I want to under, this is how, okay, so that's why I'm, I'm explaining that, because I want you to, when you hear this, start attaching all that stuff that 
shows you what's happening in the government right now because of your silence is absolutely unlawful where you can identify a punitive damage without due process. It doesn't matter whether it's going to be criminal or civil or code or any of that stuff. Now, for those of you that are in the mining law, you have to understand now work dates too. Put dates in your mind. These laws for civil rights came in 1868. Your mining law starts in 1866. That also size when you put the dots together, but those of you that are fearful of the citizen of the United States moniker, you have to understand the distinction. The 68 laws could not condition the 66 relation to Congress and your property. And so that none of this is supposed to apply. And you're going to hear here when I read, when you listen to livelihood, those of you that have property, and you understand that what was granted to you against the government itself after the grant, evidenced either by your notice, location notice or your patent or any uh, state certified patent, that that prohibition against the whole world works to protect you because the pertinent right to the grant was your livelihood. And when you start tying all these, these points together, you will understand better where you actually have your power and rights and where the current system has none. If you're interested in that, please continue to listen. If you don't, if you just want to be a typer in the chat rooms or just send out all, out and do the memosphere and try to be all so, so sharp and smart and mediocre, as I put in memes, meme is mediocre, folks. It's not, the truth is action. Even an anarchist, by the actual definition, is active. They're doing something, not just talking about it, not just sequestering themselves away from it. But anyway, this is an inter This has become an interesting case. I'm going to just tell you the word so that maybe it makes more importance to you, maybe in your mind. That this is not inconsequential, what they've said here. It's not even, they've in their decision, they're telling you how they got there. We're going to use that. But the holding is the only thing you can rely upon in the in the decision. So as a word of caution, the holding, what they hold, is what's important. How they get there, not so much. However, it sets the stage for how you will use, essentially against their own word, against their own word, how they're violating you in other ways. And because this goes from outside of the criminal sphere into anything punitive, this now brings everybody who's ever been addressed, aggressed, oppressed by the government into a word that they can put in their mouth, just like I've been saying. So if, let me start reading now. It's going to take a little bit, but I'd like you to listen because the history. Oh, and thank you for the emails. I haven't can't get to some of you. Uh, again, uh, just so much going on, and I forgot to look. I hope the audio is fine. I've been having some serious trouble with it. I hope I have... Uh, Hope we're in, in here today uh, with anything. I mean, it's been really kind of strange. But at any rate, it's been taking some of my time. But those of you that are asking about history and stuff, reading this uh, court case will bring a little bit of history for you. Uh, it'll bring it relative to the Civil War, and it'll it make some statements that are really interesting. In fact, Thomas uh, Justice Thomas's statement at the end, concurring with the outcome but not for the reason, is absolutely a, a exp ex an exposure. It's exposure of how fallen the system of justice is. It's an exposure that the justices also have reasons that are different. It, it starts to set up that this is a minefield anyway going in, and then they only give you a little bit. You know, 10% of you get it in. In fact, I was in reading the recent denial to the miners of their, their, their uh, suit to the Supreme Court. There was page after page of, of denials of the certiorari right to review uh, what people thought were wrongs. Uh, in this case, the miners got taken down as well. We predicted that. That's not a problem. Uh, but guess what? We look at this case, and it looks like we can argue that, not argue, we just pointed out to the Supreme Court, in denying a remedy, they also violated this law, this their own decision in Timms. Think about that. Because the reason why they were stopped was for an environmental aesthetic cause punitively without any due process. And so Tim says that the dis denial to a minor's remedy and it is a violation of their own Tim's decision. And now I've got a little technical there, but if you follow how, what I'm, I'm trying to tell you this stuff, because it's applicable what they're saying here, whether I want to agree with it, whether I realize I agree that they even had the right to do this and how they got there, this is where we are. 
I'm okay with t- picking up where, where they have said it is going where things are. The reality is this way, even if it's not the reality, it's that way for them. And then we, we can use it again to continue in the pressing of the, of actual justice that's been denied to us all. And until we start doing that, the occupier wins. Remember, these are all just a bunch of, of bar members. You get up to the Supreme Court, I don't think they have to be a bar member, but you're not going to get anybody that's underneath the scrutiny of being able to be brought into a law, into the Supreme Court unless you have been a, an attorney, a bar member. And so your life is controlled whether you want to agree with it or not. Being quiet to it in this situation is not going to help. So let me get on to here. I'm going to read the end of the the summary. It's not really. They'll tell you in the front of it. It's not. It's not authoritative. It's just. A, it's just an opinion of what the of what the decision said. But it encapsulates some things that I want to have you in, in your mind before I start reading. And we'll go through the the history of the case and the history of how they come to this decision. And listen very carefully to where you have rights against the government when anything becomes punitive as an excess and violation to the Eighth Amendment of the original Constitution as applied to the states. And, and I, so let me say one more thing to remind you, as I say, for those of you that think you think states' rights is the answer, this case shows you that a state is willing to destroy you, steal from you, if it didn't have this constraint that it thought was only applicable to the federal government. So let me start reading. There's so much to talk about here. It's, I mean, literally, it, this, it, especially Thomas, Justice Thomas's dis- discussion, it dredged up so much old research that I'd done to re- come bring back out what the what had been decided, like the Dred Scott case uh, that brought up the the, the uh, slaughterhouse cases. This is where butchers were wanting equal rights and, and things like that. And then then the court changes after all that, and he points all this out. And so it's uh, like I don't want to get into all that, but there's so much to talk about here. But we can take it today. Brand new technology is right out of the right out of the opinion of the Supreme Court that all their system listens to. Now, now we can directly apply this Tim's case to almost almost all legislation coming out at least of one state. Certainly within what we sued to enjoin, it's with it confirms what we sued to enjoin in 2013. Now we're going to be in fact now we're going to add this to another letter to the state to tell the governor. Uh, you got legislation that may be hitting your desk. Don't sign it because it's a violation of law. And now we've got the Tim's case to to confirm that. Uh, so again, those of us that are in it, uh, action, trying to do our thing, we're doing the best peaceful action we can using the law that doesn't seem to exist anywhere else. You have to as well. Otherwise, it's it's really nothing. There's nothing you're you're doing but scre- you know, screaming into the breeze. You're just a candle in the wind. And I hope I the T I M B S. I hope I'm pronouncing Tim's correctly there. That, no, notwithstanding, doesn't matter. Let's go on. I'm reading only the very bo- bottom of the summary, and then I'm going to go on to the decision. The second argument that the excessive fines clause cannot be incorporated if it applies to civil in rem forfeitures misapprehends the nature of the incorporation inquiry. In considering whether the 14th Amendment incorporates a bill of rights protection, this court asks whether the right guaranteed, not each and every particular application of that right, is fundamental or deeply rooted. To suggest otherwise is inconsistent with the approach taken in the cases concerning novel application of rights already deemed incorporated. See Packingham versus North Carolina. The excessive fine clause is thus incorporated regardless of whether application of the clause is civil in rem forfeitures is itself fundamental or deeply rooted. They vacated this decision and remanded it back. Remember, this is a case of review. Now, cases of review are saying that this is a really an administrative issue. And I would have to look at this case and say, they even, if you read between the lines in this case and this decision, they, they tell the state of Indiana, we're only here for the question. You've tried to expand the authority into something else. You didn't bring, if you read between the lines, they're saying, you didn't bring this as an original action to our original jurisdiction. I'll leave for now whether that's possible. But the point is, they're telling the, the Indiana, you didn't come by way of your right to come here. You came by way of your, essentially, your administration of the federal will. And remember, I want to remind you, you have to understand, all this stuff just starts to come to bear. 
Remember I told you that the CIA World Factbook will say the states in the United States are administrative divisions. Consider that when you hear a very important statement come up, which I'll point out. I'll try and point out some things here. I'm going to interrupt this, but if you can keep your mind working on what I'm saying and then apply to what they're actually saying there, you'll have the remedy later. But you'll have the excuse me, the decision later. It's a PDF link. You can go back and listen. I want to be able to say some things. The, you'll hear something about the foundation of this country after the Civil War. And this is where I'm telling you, be very careful of what you think is. And you better, I would offer you to you to suggest, you better think about the way they're working it, not the way you think it ought to be. And you're going to hear proof of that right here, where they decide in this case. And they still give the right. And this also sounds in, sounds like an admiralty. Sounds. But this also speaks to international law. They can only take the law as they found it, even when they, when you'll hear it, they fundamentally changed the foundation of the United States. I've told you this for years. Now here it comes. And so here, let's go on to the decision. That the in the civ, even whatever you'll find any punitive thing the Eighth Amendment attaches to is a, a massive thing for y'all. Uh, just to tell you. And so, let's go to a decision rendered um, apparently February 20th in 2019. Uh, Justice Ginsburg delivered the opinion of the court. Tyson Timms pleaded guilty in Indiana State Court to dealing in a controlled substance and conspiracy to commit theft. The trial court sentenced him to one year of home detention and five years of probation, which included a court-supervised addiction treatment program. The sentence also required Tim's to pay fees and costs totaling $1,203. At the time of Tim's arrest, the police seized his vehicle, a Land Rover SUV Tim's had purchased for about $42,000. Tim's paid for the vehicle with money he had received from an insurance policy when his father died. The state engaged in private, a, a private law firm to bring a civil suit for forfeiture of Tim's Land, Tim's's Land Rover, charging that the vehicle had been used in, to transport heroin. After Tim's's guilty plea in the criminal case, the trial court held a hearing on the forfeiture demand. Although finding that Tim's' vehicle had been used to facilitate violation of the criminal statute, the court denied the requested forfeiture, observing that Tim's had recently purchased the vehicle for $42,000, more than four times the maximum $10,000 monetary fine accessible against him for his drug conviction. Forfeiture of the Land Rover, the court determined, would be grossly disproportionate to the gravity of Tim's offense, hence unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment Excessive Fines Clause. The Court of Appeals of Indiana affirmed that determination, but the Indiana Supreme Court reversed. The Indiana Supreme Court did not decide whether the forfeiture would be excessive. Instead, it held the exercise fa Excessive Fine Clause constrains only federal action and is inapplicable to state impositions. Now, so the court says here in the decision, we granted certiorari. We granted the petition for review. This is the thing that was just denied to the miners, and right in a way, in a way, rightfully so. And the, the miners didn't do, they didn't get the right uh, attorney to do what they needed to do. They won't, and they won't, and uh, got a bunch of officials that were not doing the law and won't do the law. A bunch of incompetent courts that were involved that weren't called out, and so we got a major problem. But this case says, starts to say a little different. So they granted certiorari when the Supreme Court of Indiana, for those of you states say states' rights, they'll protect you under a, being a state citizen, which rides underneath the skin of this case. That's the slaughterhouse cases. The state citizen versus the federal citizen. So there was a big thing done in the 90s over about that. A lot of people started going in trouble about all this stuff. So anyway, so for me, it's a long history of watching people getting hurt by trying to make distinctions where the system won't, even though distinctions are supposed to be there. How do I make the distinction? I went to this interesting little problem for the government by saying, well, in a pre-1868 pre granted right cannot be encumbered by the exactions of every kind imposition that you gave to freedmen as white citizens. Remember, 42 U.S.C. 1981. And so we've got a whole different set of laws uh, that work to get us prior to 
the civil rights 14th Amendment citizen that everyone reviles, and maybe rightfully so, but we have the same name status, but it's different in how it can be treated. This case says you can't even treat it, but even if we were to treat it, it says that you cannot, eventually you'll hear, it cannot interfere with even in a business. This is commerce side. There's another thing about this case, this decision. Even in commerce side, remember that's where the driver was. That's what doing drugs. It's all commerce. Even in commerce side, you can't steal the business's ability to continue doing business. This is bankruptcy law. That's impliedly a bankruptcy condition and a bankruptcy government. So for those of you that uh, will say, oh, 1933, we went to bankruptcy, how about if you just go ahead and use the status of the condition and how your rights get funneled through and stop trying to tell everybody what you think you know. Just utilize what they're, how they're applying it and show how that should, cannot be applied to you. And you, there's a couple of ways to do that. I'm not here to discuss all that. I'm here telling you there's ways to apply this the way it's handed to you in the way it should be done because otherwise it's not it's not going to be uh, recognized. And then you have no proof because of the way they, they work it. So let me continue here. We granted search The Supreme Court's going to grant the review. A review of a, what appears to be uh, an administrative condition when you look right at it. The question presented, for those of you that understand appeal, uh, review appeals court, you present questions whether or not the question was substantive to due process and then met by the court. And the court, a reviewing court will look in that regard and only to that question. And you'll hear that in this case. So here we go. Read. I'll read quite a read uh, a little bit more here without talking. The question presented is the Eighth Amendment's excessive fine clause an incorporated protection applicable to the states under the Fourteenth Amendment's due process clause? Like the Eighth Amendment's prescriptions of cruel and unusual punishment and, quote, excessive bail, the protections against excessive fines guards against abuses of government's punitive or criminal law enforcement authority. This safeguard we hold is, quote, fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty, with deep roots in our history and tradition. History and tradition. That was the McDonald case, McDonald versus Chicago case of 2010. So for those of you that find that they start, you start using old law, they say this too old. Here, you can use this case if you're on the point of this issue. This is current stuff. The excessive fines clause is therefore incorporated by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. You go back and say you heard that they said we hold. That's the only thing you can actually use in this case is what they hold or what they have held and they've referred to. The reasoning isn't an authority, but it is how you explain how your rights are consistent with this outcome. And so you have to be, treat those a little different when you go to asserting them. And again, you just place all this that's relevant to your problem at their lap and say, you've already decided this this way. Why am I not treated the same, essentially? So let me go on reading some more. When, now here it is. Well, here comes, we have the history of what's going on. We have the holding already happened. Now they're going to explain how they get there. And this is where I, I actually jump in with from my colleague telling me. He said, you know, they mentioned the Civil War in that, and it, uh, it's an interesting statement. I go, really? Why would they mention that there for the Eighth Amendment? And then he told me, well, it was because the state tried to impose the thing, and the defense was the, that the Fourteenth the Amendment applies. I said, well, that's a non. I mean, that's a winner for him. If he, the state said not, well, here it is. It's the winner for him. And the state said not, and they're wrong. But why'd they reference the Civil War? And here we go, folks. Here's your history. Here's all these rules and laws. Here's how you all, you all, seventeen. 91 to 1891 type people all get all fired up. It's all in here, right here, if you understand how to put it together. you got to put this in your mind, chronologically go through the history as they put it, put it on in order, because if you don't, you get confused. And I again, I'm trying not to make anybody confused ever. I'm trying to show you that there's an orderly way to put your orderly facts in to make orderly justice, as they are telling you in this case. Here we go. A, 1A, Section 1A. When ratified in 1791, the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. Baron X. Rel. Terenen and, uh, and versus Mayor of Baltimore. Quote, the constitutional amendments adopted in the aftermath of the Civil War, close quote, 
However, quote, listen carefully here, folks, quote, fundamentally altered our country's federal system. I'm going to say it again. This is the key right here for all you all that kind of go back to the organic documents and think those are relevant without showing how you can con connect up there. And this is what that mining law does. Remember, the relation back doctrine works. And it's not working because I say so. It works because the government says so. It works because I agreed to accept as a mining, as a mining grantee, a mining a land grantee, that I accepted their contract, their offer. And we predate this condition. So let me get back over. Uh, let me read this point. Let me reread it. The constitutional amendments adopted in the aftermath of the Civil War, however, fundamentally altered our country's federal system. I, I'm let, I gotta let you, you gotta think about this, folks, for all y'all that think you got it understood. A big deal happened in the Civil War. I've been telling you about it. And this is how you have to alter what you do. And if you don't, give it up. You want to just stop. And if you're not willing, then you don't have a you don't have a liberty bone in your body. Because in this case, although they say the states can beat down on you, and you see they will, they say there's a limit. And I point out in the mining law, you can't even attach us. Why? Because the grant was a property that was in relation to the congressional disposal that has its pertinent livelihoods. That you, even if you consider this a business, you can't attach. So interfering in any way violates not just this decision, but the congressional separation of powers problem, which now, if you kind of bring this through real quick, by this decision, the Supreme Court has on them as well when they denied a remedy to a grantee, as they just did. <laughs> it's so fantastic, right? Uh, we can point it all out. But you see, the system of law is broken. And that doesn't mean that we give up because the, the law is in us. The people. And let me go back to reading here. Let me reread. This is so important. I can't even believe it. I was, couldn't. I had to reread this myself over and over. So I'm going to do it for you one more time. And you got to really consider what I've been saying all this time. And uh, anyway, the constitutional amendments adopted in the aftermath of the Civil War, however, fundamentally altered our country's federal system. With only a handful of exceptions, this court has held the 14th Amendment's due process clause incorporates. The protection contained in the Bill of Rights, rendering them applicable to the states. If Bill of Rights protection is incorporated, we have explained, if it is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty, or deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. They didn't say law here, did they? History and tradition. Now you understand when I talk in the mining law, why I always bring up Customs, traditions, and the history of miners as another layer of required statement when you're going to uh, assert your right and attachment to things prior to the time that the United States, the foundations were shaken and changed and altered fundamentally. So understand, there's a, there's, if you can follow what I've been saying about putting your the pieces together, you put them in a certain way. And all of a sudden, your rights develop from that in a way that they are saying, through the way they're saying it here. You're not making new words, actually. See, it's not. It's kind of like copy and paste. You just got to know what to copy and paste. Let me get back. This is so important. I got so much to say. I really need to read this so that you get the point. You could read it yourself, but I want to be able to get through some things. And so, this is why I say I wish we had, you know, a bigger, a better conversation we could have on these kinds of things and get people more focused on really what has to happen and discard all that all that baggage we carry around going on incorporate still under a section 1a incorporated bill of rights and, and this incorporated word means including but it also means exactly what you hear it's an incorporation isn't it and so we got to keep that going because that's just sitting there at the, as a, another category of, of proof if you'll allow yourself to do that and go ahead and not be so I'm going to tell you what the world's like and listen more what they're telling you the words world's like and when you start doing that, you'll be able to walk right through all of this stuff. You can speak to all of the cons all of the things that they have set up that's in our way, why we exist in this oppression. 
They are going on. So A1A, last paragraph. Incorporated Bill of Rights guarantees are, quote, enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect those personal rights against federal encroachment. I can't tell you how powerful that's been. I get chills just a little bit here, folks, when I'm, I know that the Article 3 that they talk about in the Constitution, what courts and the Article 3 courts are established for you to vindicate pers what they call personal rights, your private rights. I also, and those of you that have done the study, you know that there's an obstruction to the, obstruction to the Constitutional Article 3 court where you would vindicate your private rights in the federal, against federal encroachment. Now applicable to the states. If we didn't know it before, this decision says this exactly, folks. You're hearing about Article 3 right there, folks, but you try to find that. And those of you who have done the study, you know, or what is it, to 28 U.S.C. 81 to about 133, Section 133? There's only two Article 3 courts, and you're going to be, have a tough time getting into them. At any rate, anyway, they say here it's available. So, again, when I'm saying read between the lines, I mean, really, read, but listen between the lines here, folks. And I'm probably talking beyond a lot of people here. I don't mean to. I don't mean to insult you when I say that. It just it just shows you this how far we have to step, how dumbed down we've been, and what we were supposed to maintain is all I can tell you. I'm here to explain some of this. Please take it on and and apply it, and then you become where I'm at you know, in this in this knowledge and saying you look at the world, at least your country in a way, this thing that they've set up around you. You have to see it in a different different way, and that it's empowering at some level. You don't I don't hear feel defeated when I read this stuff. Like I can't tell you I'm invigorated because it's a lot. It can be a lot of work and it takes up your life. But that's because the more of this that you have to sh see that it takes up your life is how far the encroachment has become. It was never supposed to be here. But what did Tom uh, Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson say? It took a mass of educated people that were vigilant to protect themselves. And look around. No, we live in memeified territory. Meme, you know, mediocre me memes. That's it. We don't have a deeper thought. And I come and talk, and a lot of people, a lot of people are very interested, but it's like beyond. And some of you can hang on and you go further, which I'm just thrilled by. But this is where we need to go. Okay, let me get, thus the Bill of Rights is protected, protections is incorporated. No, excuse me. I'll go back up. I jumped. Uh, enforcement against the states of the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect those personal rights against the federal government as applicable against the states, folks, as I add this on. Now, going on last state, last sentence. Thus, if a Bill of Rights protection is incorporated, there is no daylight between it, the federal and the state conduct it prohibits or requires. Let me remind you of what I said. Didn't the CIA say these are administrative divisions of the federal state? Doesn't the, uh, what, 1871 Act say there's, there's districts set up for the judiciary we find out are not constitutional but territorial courts? And I can point to you, because of Lincoln and the Civil War, they're military in nature, even though you won't be told that. Getting on. Section B now in the decision. Under the Eighth Amendment, quote, excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted, close quote. Taken together, let me, I need to stop here. They're saying no excessive fines. Remember, they forfeited a property from the guy and they're finding here that was in violation. So fines can be moved over to property. So, so don't lose that little detail. Again, these, the, you really have to pull these things together to use them, and they they give you a pathway. To me, it's clear as day. And then, like I said, my my colleague called up and said, "Did you read this part?" I go, "No, I haven't really read the decision." Well, it says this. I go, "Wow, we need to go read that. We need to read that decision." That's exactly what we have been saying. That's what we sued on in 2013, and we only sued there because we have this view what this decision's exposing to you all if you haven't ever seen it or heard it before. What I tell you in pieces, because I have nothing to attach it to. Uh, well, I attach it to the notice to you all, and it comes in different ways. So it's kind of spread out a bit. But I can tell you that you'll, if you've heard me any length of time, what I've told you is really consistent with what's being succinctly put together in this case. Going back on, to get taken together, the clauses place 
parallel limitations on the power of those entrusted with the criminal law function of government. Browning Ferris Industries versus VT Incorporated versus of VT Incorporated versus Kelco Disposal Incorporated, 1989. Let me go back and touch on that. Entrusted. Are you putting power in these words, folks? You need to. Remember I talked to you in the property law about a, a relationship and trust. Not just the, or the trust established by an oath of office. Not just the trust established through the obligations and duties of the government itself. But there's a trust in the function of government. In this case, the criminal law function is a trust. And we could disregard all this and be run down all the time, or we can regard it and start applying the principles that none of us really have a, have a handle on. And I say I include myself because I'm learning more every day on how this really starts to integrate. This decision really kind of, ex it didn't teach me nothing new. It should say anything new. It would be more correct here. It didn't teach me anything new, actually, but it sure tied it back up and allowed me to tie more of the puzzle together. It's all sitting right there for us if we're, if we're open to it. Going on reading section B, second, parent, second sentence, uh, third sentence. Directly at issue here is the phrase, quote, nor excessive fines imposed, which limits the government's power to extract payments, whether in cash or in kind, as punishments for some offense. United States versus Baja Kajian, 1998. They're all referring to recent decisions, folks. Understand that. Don't underestimate the problem with that and the power as well, whether relative to a right of land or a relation of trust that predates all this. Now, they have a footnote. I'm, I'll let you read that. It's going to bring us off a little bit, but so I'm not going to read it. I'll just continue. Uh, it doesn't change anything. It just explains the footnotes are explanatory and directional. You can go find out what the heck they're talking about. And so they go, they move on and they talk now to another case about Austin versus the United States supporting the last comment. It goes on the 14th Amendment. We hold, so you listen now here, we hold incorporates this protection. That's all, that's all this court, this case did. We hold the 14th Amendment incorporates this protection as against the state itself. That's this whole decision is just that right there. That's it. Then so. The summary will expand upon that, which you can do. You can use that. But it's not actually the holding. This is the reasoning behind the holding. The holding is a real simple sentence. And so I caution everybody to run, use the holding, but make sure you explain that the reasoning, the decision was gotten by this by this um, set of, set of re rationale. You don't rely on it as the holding. And so you don't make that mistake like I see lots of people wanting to do. They exalt opinion above the holding, and that's, you can't do that. So, we hold, incorporate, uh, the 14th Amendment incorporates the protection. The excessive fines clause, these excessive fines clause, uh, you'll see is capitalized. It's a thing, a noun. It's not just a, a word, a adjective. It's not just something descriptive. It's, it's a thing. The clause. What do I say? Well, I talk about clauses. These are contracts, essentially. These bills, the Bill of Rights, the Constitutions, compacts, they're all contracts. They have clauses. When I say look for your savings clause, look for your exceptions, look for the exceptions for the agencies of the government that can do something but for the prohibition to the exception. That's the savings clauses. These are, if you miss these, you're missing everything. If you don't talk through them, you got, you're saying nothing. You become those people that they are, that they claim to be terrorists and paper filers. Instead of like myself, they don't, never, they never called me a terrorist or paper filer. They're just a paper, just to file paper to overwhelm them. I've never, ever done that in all my decades of doing this, folks. You don't have to. And yet I, I get crickets on their side, which for us, for me, is good. Not good in one regard, because what does that mean? For all the high-sounding statement in this decision, ultimately the lower class of the court and the, and the enforcers are criminal. And, 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 but interestingly, the district court here got it right, didn't they? The, 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 the local court, excuse me, got it right. It was the Supreme Court, the High Mucky Muck Attorney Bar Association. Those are the ones that got it wrong. And so understand that dynamic, too. Actually, this judge in there was trying to do it right. He did it right. So you got to seek those people out to find out, look, and see if he's done other things. That may be one good judge. I don't know. And not everybody's a criminal. 
not everybody gets in to be a criminal. They just find themselves in a system that's an organized crime. How many lawyers, I mean, guys that would put law, like a, a sawyer is the one who saw the, the livelihood of sawing, or um, uh, what do they do for wheels? Darn it, I can't think of that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The yours uh, are what the law does. You do, that you apply your livelihood as doing things. A lawyer would typically do law. The things with the morality attached. Legal, you're just an attorney. And there's, it's a more, I've got no sense whatsoever. The excessive fine clause traces its venerable lineage back at least to 1215. No, I mean, so many thoughts go through my mind. I'm going to just start reading because they're just, they're, they're inform, maybe informative, but you all should know them about the Magna Carta, about the, let me just headlight, subtext some of this. We were supposed to be separate, but they adopt this stuff. We're supposed to be different, and they don't adjust it. Uh, they refer back to this stuff, but they'll deny it in other places. You have to understand the dynamic of this whole, again, the battlefield. But they reference something here relative to this lineage. And so we'll go with it. In 1215, when the Magna Carta guaranteed that a free man, hyphenated free man, shall not be immersed for a small fault, but after the manner of the fault, and for the great for a great fault after the greatness thereof, saving to him his contentment. His contentment. You have to go read the research these definite these words. Let's go down to the bottom and at least find what an immersement is. If you think some of these you look in the dictionary, they say these are obsolete, folks. These words are working today. Immersements were payments to the crown and were required of individuals who were in the king's mercy because of some act offensive to the crown. Though fines and immersements had distinct historical antecedents, they served fundamentally similar purposes, and by the 17th and 18th centuries, the terms were often used interchangeably, referencing the brief for Eighth Amendment scholars as Amicus Curiae 12 mentions. So this is what they're talking about in the immersements. The free man shall not be immersed, shall not be held liable to the crown for some offense beyond what he can pay. Now, I've said this to the miners all the time. They can't. The, the mining property was granted with a pertinent right of livelihood. That's what that's for. In other words, you, you, you can't. The contentment is the is the livelihood. You have to do some awful wrong to have that interfered with at all. That includes in commerce with businesses that can't interfere with you and your business. They can't take away from you the ability to continue in business. They can't take so much to destroy you. I've just defined bankruptcy to you folks, if you just look between the lines there. Well, this refers back, if you look in history for the miners, you couldn't, even when a miner, someone got, you couldn't take away the miner's tools. You couldn't take away his gun. You couldn't take away his horse. You couldn't take that away from anybody, because the horse and the gun and, and the pro and whatever tools he had was how he made it. You couldn't reduce somebody as a penalty to take all that from somebody. It is decided in this case. And I've told you before. Look at when you're not a business and they're exacting from you, they violated that provision, haven't they? And this is where I tell you when you look at using the road by right instead of what you want to claim is drive by right, which is actually in commerce, then they're presuming upon you some commerce activity that you haven't put evidence of that you can't pay. And so they presume that you can. Well, as a right, they have no right to encroach. So any imposition is a problem, isn't it? Well, I would hope you'd say yes. Let me get back to this discussion. We have quite a bit to read. Not forever and ever, but quite a bit. Very instructive here for all y'all that have listened to me for a long time and wanting to put stuff together. What I say, what I what I say without support is right here actually. When you extend it out to what I talk about, why I say what I say, I'd never seen this case before. It's all from other studies. Like there's so much studies, I don't even know where I get this information. But it doesn't matter. It's here today. It's here in a concise place for y'all who are really interested in starting to move yourself together, move yourself forward, and maybe even together about how this works with y'all, because it's really the mass of us doing this. As relevant here, Magna Carta required that economic sanctions be proportioned to the wrong and 
quote, not be so large as to deprive brackets an offender of his livelihood. Not be so large as to deprive an offender of his livelihood. What if you're not even an offender, folks? Not a fender bender, an offender. What if you have a right to do what you are doing and they attach your livelihood? So, as I'm talking, as I'm talking, these thoughts are going through my mind. I'm trying to show you how they hopefully are going through your mind. Because you have to work, you can work with this stuff. It's not just sitting out there not to be, not to be worked with for your betterment. They cannot affect your livelihood. They cannot affect you to interfere with your livelihood. So what is your statement? Where they have the right to impose? Isn't this impliedly the requirement to state how you can't pay? Isn't this really also tied to what I talked to you about, the right of allocution? In a commerce court, isn't your statement in the commerce court that this is excessive because it interferes with my livelihood? I'm not even in the, the, the business that you're charging me for, let alone it's interfering with my livelihood. Can you see how that's relevant now? I've been telling you this for years. This this case allows me maybe to bring it together for you all if you hadn't put it together. If you cared, I, I hope you care. Then why, I mean, I tell you, you know, I don't want you to just listen to me. I don't know what else to do to tell you. It takes time, so you have to listen to me for a while. And I only am encouraged the fact that that while is worthy because you, some of you tell me that. And so, I'm, you know, again, I just only tell you, it encourages me to continue. Uh, I see the help. I see the, I see B people change. I see them, my, well, I guess for me, I see that I know, I'm not fearful you're walking yourself into a meat grinder. At some point, you start sounding like you could actually step aside that, where most, some of you can't. Now, let me get back to this. It's so easy to go off, but let me reread this. It's so important. There's no penalty that can be opposed upon you in the form that they call as a fine, but it could be something in kind. Remember that connection. This is important. That it cannot be, it has to be proportioned to the wrong. It cannot be so large as to deprive you of your livelihood. This is impliedly telling you you have to be able to state how it does if you want to mitigate the harm they are given license by this decision to do to you. For those of you in property, where the government, you can show the government was the obligation and duty to not encroach the property, you're not even the offender. And this is what I try to tell the miners, but they don't, most don't listen. The few that do, we're doing, they're doing well, well enough. And this is the only, this is the subtle distinction behind the whole thing. It's in this case right here. You just read it. And it's just, it, my colleague looked and saw this as well. And he, and he, I was, I had to explain a couple things to him, but he already sent, you can see, you can see, feel it in your bones, folks, that the, how wrong the state governments are coming against us at this point and how right you are to assert against it, how wrong they'd be to try and stop that assertion. It's right this, in this case right here going on. Uh, see also 4W Blackstone Commentaries of the Laws of England, 1769. Quote, no man shall have a larger immersement imposed upon him than his circumstances or personal estate will bear. Taking no position of, oh, this is a bank, Bajan re reference, taking no position on the question whether the person's income and wealth are relevant considerations in judging the excessiveness of the fine. Despite the Magna Carta imposition of excessive fines persisted, Despite Magna Carta, impositions of excessive fines persisted. Can I say this again for you states' rights people? Despite the Magna Carta, despite Magna Carta, despite Magna Carta, impositions of excessive fines persisted. If you don't think that official oppression is the rule first, and that your states, as they reference through back to the Magna Carta, are the same beast, take note, at least for the first time in your life. Despite the law, the agreement, the contract, however coercively it gained, there's never talking, the Supreme Court does not recognize a coercive nature to the Magna Carta. It understands the principles that were moved and induced and brought forward to the United States government. Uh, and it says, that despite that, uh, these fines persisted, meaning the ones in power don't care. 
And if a, if a mass of educated people would actually get that, finally, because they're massed and educated and massed up to understand that, we would be vigilant to stop these oppressors in government, the caucusocracy. That you see the caucusocracy is kind of pointing three fingers back at you. But despite the Magna Carta, impositions of excessive fines persisted, implying fines were okay. You live in a you live in a in a, a, a parasitic state here, folks. Despite Magna Carta impositions of excessive fines persisted, the seventeenth century Stuart kings in particular were criticized for using large fines to raise revenue, harass their political foes, and indefinitely detain those unable to pay. Do we have indefinite detention today without an ability to pay? If you don't think these people are still in control, how about harass their political foes? When I explained to you that climate change and sustainable development is a political agenda, and their minions are uh, called so-called uh, scientists, as I mentioned in, the, in Twitter, I think it was yesterday, to Kim.com, who, who I'm shocked in a way, uh, maybe not so much in some regards, but he wants to embrace climate change like it's that the, the scientists uh, re referring politically to Trump as being a genius, but not referring to the, the knowledge of the scientists. I had to explain to Kim.com, uh, apparently he doesn't know this, that those so-called scientists are actually political lobbyists as described in their own documents for such, under the color of science. Am I arguing climate change or sustainable development? No, I'm looking at the minions that they use to foist the fraud. I'm looking at their agents, and I'm saying those people are criminals. I don't have to get into the minutia of, this, of the fraud. The, the climate change, AG, AWG, is fraud. Their agents come under the color of legitimate legitimacy. And so focus on the proper point, and I think we get to the answer quicker. No, obviously, he's not, he doesn't answer me. Big question about that. But it doesn't matter. Let's move on. The, the, the Harass their political foes. That's production versus uh, sustainable development crowd. Those are consensus-based anything. Outcomes, the things I talk about, this is them in control. And they're, they are doing this harassment. They do this stuff to harass their political foes. We are a political foe, even though we're not a political creature being in production. They fabricated that as well. well. Let me go on. See, there's so much to say and explodes, expose while I'm reading the Supreme Court's decision on how they got to the fact that the Eighth Amendment applies to the states, the thing that the Civil War fundamentally changed in the structure of this nation. And if you miss that detail, you're missing probably the whole thing at this point, because it got worse from there. So we're here today now, indefinite detention without paying. They don't even want to take your money now. Why? Because the money is irrelevant, isn't it? They realize they can work on the full faith and credit of the people, and that's a fraud, and uh, without accountability. Then they stuck under the, everything under necessity. And I've been asking you to challenge that, for those of you that will. Uh, any, so anyway, here we are. And we have this case to do that, exactly. Yeah, actually, if you understand this. Uh, so the Stuart Kings, in particular, were criticized for using large fines to raise revenue, harass their political foes, and indefinitely detain those unable to pay. The debtor prisons folks today? You see how general how these these points that they're saying saying can expose the weakness and soft underbelly of these people, the caucusocracy in the states you were supposed to keep as a republic instead of the caucusocracy they've turned into. The Grand Remonstrance is refers to in the constitutional documents of the Puritan Revolution, referencing 1625 to 1660, Brow and Brow Browning Ferris, excuse me case that they referred before, when James II was overthrown in the glorious revolution, the attendant English Bill of Rights reaffirmed Magna Carta's guarantee by providing that excessive bail ought not to be required, no excessive fines improve, imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. William and Mary first, chapter 2, section 10. Uh, let's go on. I, I, uh, 1689, I think it's important to watch the chronology. That, that's when that was done. How long ago, folks? And it's still, like I say, all this stuff exists and the fines and the penalties and the exactions of every kind are still imposed. Is another type of notice to you, something that we need to get a handle on. Across the Atlantic, this familiar language was adopted almost verbatim, first in the Virginia Declaration of, the, of Rights, then in the Eighth Amendment, which states, quote, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted, close quote. Adoption of the excessive fines clause was in tune not only to the English law, 
the clause re resonated well as well with the similar similar colonial era provisions. All fines shall be moderate in saving men's contentments, merchandise, or wainage. If you think all these weird words were obsolete, they're being used today. They're applicable today. And those of you that never heard these words haven't read enough. I can just tell you. <laughs> this is how they're getting us as well. Men's contentments, merchandise, or wainage. Wainage, I think, is the, the agricultural. You, you can't be interfered with your agricultural tools your ability to make food. This is really just the same thing I've been talking about all the time, about the production. You have the right of production. They can't interfere with you in a nation that's going to be healthy. They can't interfere with production. The primary economy. And they're not supposed, their laws do not come down to affect that if you look very carefully here. Your contentment, your things that you need to keep going. To be content, if you will, if I can shorten it up for that. Merchandise, that is commerce, folks, directly. So a business under bankruptcy, you can't be destroyed by some, some creditor, so-called, coming up after you. And for sure, in law, after the 30s. These were safe harbors, if you will, because they can't, you, they've learned. It's like the just applying that military, that what was it, the Libra Code, saying you can't destroy the people. The, the, you end up having a bigger liability. And they get and they get kind of angry about that. And we're going to fix that right here. You just don't, you don't beat them down so bad that they can't continue. You beat them down to that point, but you don't beat them down any further. This is recognized in a statement from 1909, folks. If you don't heard, if you have, if you don't see how much even worse it's gotten, and this it changes also in the it doesn't change. This provision doesn't change. What starts to change is where, how far down they're going to beat you when the Trading with the Enemy Act happens. Just about what eight years later. Again, keep your chronology going on what's going on here. What what may come to bear to help understand the battlefield as you live it today. All fines shall be moderate and saving. Remember I said savings clauses, folks? Here we go, right here. All these words are here. I, you know, sometimes I, I, I may sound weird to people using this kind of weird language, but I got it from these types of things because that's in the law. What do I tell the miners? Stop using the administrative language. Use the law, the language of the law. And you will, I found it almost Im, impossible, actually, to cross over I, into an administrative condition and get yourself beat up under it. You just make sure, you talk about language, you make sure your language is separate and there's a chasm that develops. That's how I tell you, absolutely able to identify a criminal in office. They cross over. And they want, see, they're, they're vicious, so they will. They're parasites, too. They're looking to feed off of you. Let me go on here. All fines shall be moderate. They can't beat you down. Saving men's contentments, merchandise, and wainage. And the government got smart here. That's what they made in bankruptcy. They said, well, we're going to tell you what that value is. Now, no one objected to that, but that's what they said. You can still object to it, but no one understands that part either. Uh, they determined statutorily what the contentments, merchandise, and wainage prohibition against the attachment is. Whether you have a right, you're not an offender, are you? When you're not in bankruptcy, you're not a, you're not a, a debtor, master, not a debtor, be. And so you have the right to assert against any government official that they are not saving your contentments, merchandise, and wages, and despoiling your estate. In 1787, I just can't appreciate some of this conversation in the historical context much more right now. Because it touches what I'm telling you about how we get back there where we can't otherwise. But why? Because the Civil War, as I keep telling you. In seven, it's not a, I don't cry in my milk over it. No, that's just the fact. Now, what are we going to do with that? We're going to memify ourselves out of the constraint and oppression, or are we going to work ourselves and say, as I told you before, under international law, you look inside the contract of a concept of a neutral, and or a private a pirate a pri excuse me the the patentee underneath that other constitutional foundational constitutional concept, concept the patentee has a claim against the king in other words then we also have that relationship that the king has, is beholden to his sovereign word now you hold that sovereign hard against them because then it becomes less of a sovereign if he's not if it is not doing it's holding up its word of its grants, isn't it? And it becomes diminished in the eyes of the international uh, law, and it should be of its people. 
Even the even a king under a monarchy, a democratic monarchy, would suffer this, given you have a people that understand all this. But in 1787, the Constitution of eight states, accounting for 70% of the U.S. population, forbade excessive fines. Calabrese argued door states' rights and bills in 1781, a document of the state of California, uh, an even broader consensus obtained in 1868 upon ratification of the 14th Amendment. It, I'm pausing here, for You see consensus obtained in 1868. When you listen to me, what I tell you consensus is today, and it's felony. What have they done when the Civil War fundamentally changed the foundation of this nation? That should be a mind blower to you all right there. But I don't use, again, I'm not crying in my milk over it. I'm saying, ah, there's a condition. Look at that. Now let's put that as a reality. Let's see what we need to do about that. And when I say my rights relate back to 1866 as a property patentee, or one where the patent is as disposed as patent because of the nature of that grant and law, law, the law of the grant and the law of the how it's treated, I sur I relate back and before this new imposition as well. You would too. And so we start to get at how we start to get at how we get beyond this place where the state can beat down on you. And so those of you who say I don't have property. Well, you have the you have the right to use the road, don't you? And if you say no, you need to go Jefferson Mining District gets the Highways and Trails document and see that you do have the right to use the road. I'm not talking about driving; that's commerce. And so this applies directly to y'all, even those walking the sidewalk, because that's part of the highway. Even those that want to go through the off-beaten path in the middle of nowhere, those trails that were established and uh, statutorily accepted are your property defended by, defensible by these provisions prior to this 1868 thing that occurred. An even broader consensus obtained in 1868 upon the ratification of the 14th Amendment. By then, the constitutions of 35 of 37 states, accounting for 90% of the U.S. population, expressly prohibited, prohibited express, excessive fines. Calabrese and Agundo, individual rights under state constitutions, when the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, was their reference. Notwithstanding the states, apparent, I guess states is, States' apparent agreement that the right guaranteed by the excessive fine clause was fundamental, abuses continued. For all you states' rights people, abuses continued, notwithstanding the clause or anything. Following the Civil War, southern states enacted black codes to subjugate newly freed slaves and maintain the pre-war racial hierarchy. Hierarchy. Among these laws, provisions were draconian fines for violating broad prescriptions on, quote, vagrancy and other dubious offenses. Read uh, about that in the Mississippi Vagrant Laws, Mississippi, 1865. When newly freed slaves were unable to pay imposed fines, states often demanded involuntary labor instead. Describing black code's use of fines and other methods to replicate as much as possible a system of involuntary servitude. Congressional debates over the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the joint resolution that became the 14th Amendment, and finally measures repeatedly mentioned to use of the to, to the use of fines to coerce involuntary labor. 1866, the Congressional Globe 39 Congress, which you can find on the Internet on their database. You see all these discussions in the Congressional Globe. Today, acknowledgement of the right's fundamental nature remains widespread. As Indiana itself reports, all 50 states have the constitutional provision prohibiting the imposition of excessive fines either directly or by requiring proportionality. Reference the brief in opposition eight nine. Indeed, Indiana explains this is Indiana was the was the defendant against Tim's assertion Tim's assertion that they had exceeded the constitutional limitation upon the state. 
Indiana explains that its own Supreme Court has held that the Indiana Constitution should be interpreted to impose the same restrictions as the Eighth Amendment. Sounds like a bunch of good lawyers here right here that want to shoot themselves in the foot. But here, keep going. For good reason, the protection against excessive fines has been a constant shield throughout. Now, I want to interject here. How is that the case when they're doing impositions against prop production? Punitively. Without regarding their land, their rights, their pertinent rights of livelihood and everything else. Taking them, them away from their contentment. How is this even being followed in the in the society today? It shows you directly in this case it's not supposed to be, which means we're not stepping up enough to call out all those criminals in office. For good reason, folks. Even re good reasons being violated here by this decision here just a couple weeks ago. Well, excuse me, in February. Exorbitant tolls undermine other constitutional liberties. There's your door opening up the problem here, folks. For all of you that are putting your thinking cap on today. And if you're listening this far, thank you. We've been over here a little longer than I thought, but there's just so much to say. Exorbitant tolls undermine constitutional liberties. Excessive fines can be used, for example, to retaliate against or chill the speech of political enemies, as Stuart's critics learned several centuries ago, referencing the Browning-Ferris case. Even absent the political motive, fines may be employed, quote, in a measure out of accord with penal goals or retribution and deterrence, close quote. For fines are a source of revenue, while other forms of punishment, quote, cost a state money, referencing Hamlin versus Michigan. Let's go back up to the other point about the penal goals of retribution. Again, this, be careful on how you embrace this case. This is explaining that states can cause retribution. But as I've told you, they can do exactions of every kind, but Due process requires only so much. And how is that determined? It's determined by the statutes themselves. It says, giving you prior notice to weigh your risk management and your what it's going to cost you when they state the fine and the value and the penalty in the law. That makes it objective. That's your due process. Now, once it's given notice to you, if it's not effectively thrown over, it becomes law of the land for you, and uh, then they apply it to you. But they are. This case says they can only apply it in that a much that they tell you. And I imply this implicitly. And I've told you this before. When this gets too much traction, I, I don't know. I, I think you're going to start seeing states upping. They're going to start upping the penalties because it means nothing to the state to do so. But so this is maybe indirectly not a good thing in one way. But for those of us in property who can never be offenders on our own property or with our own property or understand to use the exceptions within their right to beat you down, but only so much. It's like the Clean Water Act. You can pollute, but only so much, right? It's the same license the government gets it, gives itself to do crime. If you understand what I've been saying there, too, is right here. We just read it. They're going on um, uh, the, uh, from Hamlin, we go on uh, that this scrutiny makes sense to scrutinize governmental action. This makes sense to scrutinize governmental action more closely when the states stand to benefit. So let me interpret that. Find the state benefit beyond its public need. In other words, it's police power. The, the concern is scarcely hypothetical. See brief of American Civil Liberties Union, uh, Amicus Curi, quote, perhaps, where they state, quote, perhaps because they are politically easier to impose than generally applicable taxes, state and local governments nationwide increasingly depend heavily on fines and fees as a source of general revenue. In short, the historic and logical case for concluding the 14th Amendment incorporates the excessive fines clause is overwhelming. Protection against excessive punitive economic sanctions secured by the clause is, to repeat, both fundamental to our scheme of now ordered liberty and deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. Interjection. They don't say law or custom or all the other couple other things that you can say here. They, it's our history and tradition, not our law, that they're referring to. I find this fascinating all by itself. But anyway, going on, still important. The state of Indiana does not, uh, section two, the state of Indiana does not meaningfully challenge the case for incorporating the excessive fine claims as a general matter. Instead, the state argues that the clause does not apply to its use of civil in rem forfeitures because the state says the clause's specific application to such forfeitures is neither fundamental nor deeply rooted. 
in Austin versus U.S. in 1993. However, this court held that the civil in rem forfeitures fall within the clause's protection when they are at least partially punitive. And there's your other door opening for you all, folks. At least partially. The climate change, carbon tax stuff, uh, the green, the green the welfare jobs, the Green New Deal, all punitive right up front without any of this stuff. Punitive, folks. This case just destroyed. Anybody that wants to step up with this case goes anywhere against sustainable development. It's punitive in its norm. Why? Because you're convicted as the wrongdoer against Gaia right up front by these people. These people are felons that are advancing all this. I keep telling you that. But here's the case you could use to prove it. Now, however, the courts held the in-rim forfeitures uh, fall within the clause. 1993, how many people have been defending themselves all these years that you've heard have been defending against the forfeitures? None. And yet all this case has been sitting there. I've been asking you and I say, why don't they, why didn't their attorneys assert this, uh, this limitation? This is a code. Uh, consistent with using your right of allocution to say, wait, well, you can find me, but you can only do it to the extent that you're not vi- harming me in some way. Now, now, for those of you that are doing fiat money, when you say you don't have any of that, or you don't use it, or you make sure that there's no evidence of it, now you don't even have anything that they have jurisdiction over to, inc- to fine you with, do they? Now, for a, pro- a production guy, he would just say all those things that you took were supporting my livelihood, you, none of which can be taken from me. Haven't you now protected your estate from even a conviction? No, it's not. I'm not going to the point to have an answer, but they don't do that. That's another problem, folks. You need to understand the basics before so that you get the right statement out of your mouth in the right point and right time. Let me go on because there's a lot of times going here. I want to get through this. I don't know if I can. Uh, the bill, uh, well, I may have to miss Tom, Thomas's uh, dis- discussion. Uh, you can do that on your own once you hear what I'm saying here. You can read how he comes and cha- looks at this a little different. He doesn't see the due process violation here, which is a very important distinction as well. He says these are privileges and immunities that don't have, have no ability to be encroached. A little different. And without sounding racist in a, in a, uh, due to color, he's a black justice who is, I would say, at least by heredity, uh, very close to the problem uh, of that of that issue of freed men uh, and uh, the question in Dred Scott of whether or not a black man could be a citizen of the United States. That's a very sensitive discussion, and he comes out squarely against. It. He says that these are the these are the line of cases that were wrongly and clearly wrongly, notoriously, he says, wrongly decided. So maybe. I won't read that. I might be able to get through this if I do that. So moving on, the, uh, the uh, Austin versus uh, United States, 1993, however, held that in rem forfeitures were within the clause. Where have been the, the lawyers to protect your property? Or the attorneys? Uh, forget that the lawyers should be protected, but they're not. They're not around. They're, they're just attorneys. They're attorneys. They do not ex- assert the property, and they're not really told. They're not educated to. If you go look at their their education process, their continuing learning education, like, look at, does it, does it do mining law? Does it do farming? Does it law? Does it do, I mean, more than contracts and things like that? Does it do the law, the land stuff? No, none of it. None of it. These people aren't here to protect you there. And it's up to you to do that. That's what your rights are yours. Uh, going on. But you can do it now if you listen to this case against the encroachment of government. Uh, again, and you'll, uh, i add this right now before I forget and think about it. You have to tie the state's acknowledgement of its uh, establishment through through the enabling acts that constructed the state uh, by the agreement of Congress on it on the state's promise. That's how you attach all this as well. That's a secondary attachment. So you get around the question as well to the citizen of the United States through the 1868 Civil Rights Fed 14th Amendment condition. That's there, too, but it's there, too, to impose on a state as an obligation, not as you as the only place you will get your rights. For those of you that have a problem with that, that's the way you get around it, uh, the way I've seen it. And I learned, uh, I figured uh, that became much clearer to me when I started doing the mining law and looked at the relation back doctrine. Your rights relate back to the acceptance of the grant of prior to the date of this imposition. Uh, so, moving on. Austin, the Austin, the Austin case of 1993, Austin rose in a federal context, but when a Bill of Rights protection is incorporated, the protection applies, quote, identically to both the federal government and states. 
citing the McDonald case. The McDonald case becomes into the summary holding. So this is a very, very important case that they're relying on relative to for, um, supporting this decision. Accordingly, the, to prevail, listen very carefully about Indiana. This is where they start to sanction, uh, to admonish Indiana. Accordingly, to prevail, Indiana must persuade us. Indiana has the burden here, folks. Indiana must persuade us either to overrule our decision in Austin or to hold that in light of Austin, the excessive fines clause is not incorporated because the clause's application to civil in rem forfeitures is neither fundamental nor deeply, deeply rooted. The first argument is not properly before us. And the second misapprehends the nature of our incorporation inquiry. Major slapdown right here, folks. Major slapdown. This is, they came up through a review. They didn't come as an original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which is you used to have the access to as a people, but don't anymore. Now only the states. And they are telling the state right here, you, you didn't come to us to clarify this as amongst other states as an original jurisdiction. You came up through the review process. And the only question before us is this, and then you misapprehended that. To justify what you've already said in your paperwork was a Supreme Court, a state Supreme Court problem. They misinterpreted their own laws and didn't even follow their own rules. Going on, number A here, moving to the next paragraph. In the Indiana Supreme Court, as I now discuss here, the state argued that the forfeiture of Tim's SUV was not, should, would not be excessive. See the brief of Opposition 5. It never argued, however, that the civil in rem forfeitures were categorically beyond the reach of the excessive fines clause. The Indiana Supreme Court, for its part, held that the clause did not apply to the states at all, and it nowhere addresses the clause's application to civil in rem forfeitures. Accordingly, Tim's sought our review of their question, quote, whether the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause is incorporated against the states under the 14th Amendment. In opposing review, Indiana attempted to reformulate the question to ask whether the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause restricts the state's use of civil asset forfeitures. And on the merits, Indiana has argued not only that the clause is not incorporated, but also that Austin was wrongly decided. Respondents, quote, write in their brief in opposition to restate the questions presented, close quote, however, quote, don't, does not give them the power to expand those questions. Now we're looking strictly at what it does, what happens on appeal, and that's where you understand the rules about how, what you're supposed to do on appeal, and whether you can get extensive in the courts there to, in this case, the courts there judging that they tried to change the story to the tune they were, they were singing to try and uh, modify what was going on. And so impliedly, they're catching the state of Indiana on doing something that they kind of, it seems to me they knew they were doing wrong. At any rate, going on, the, that's just conjecture on my part to tell you. That it is particularly the case where, as here, the respondent's reform, reformulation would lead us to address a question neither pressed nor passed upon below. This is a, strictly a review condition on the administration of a case for review. They're telling Indiana, you didn't do this right, you're, and you're trying to reformulate the question. Don't, don't change the question. The petitioner on review says, he has a problem with this that you've done. Don't change the question. This should be a very good, important focus for you all to, when you listen to people, they try to change the question on you. As so I've been telling you, don't. Don't make an issue out of it. Don't make a, a question out of it. Make the point. They go on to say here, the Supreme Court, we thus decline the state's invitation to reconsider our unanimous judgment in Austin that civil in rem forfeitures are fines for purposes of the Eighth Amendment when they are at least partially punitive. That's such a killer statement. Partially punitive invokes the Eighth Amendment protection. And it invokes what, folks? In you, that you cannot be immersed to the destruction or interference with your contentments, your, or whatever livelihood you have, or as a business, or as an agriculture, your wainage. This is just big now because it's never spoken to. Something I've been trying to tell you is there to do all the time. As a fallback, Indiana argues in Section B now of this decision, opinion of the court, excuse me, opinion, they don't give us any law now, it's just opinions of these justices, Scalia said it. Well, you brought the question to us. Don't get, ex don't get ex upset that we gave you an opinion as an answer. 
As a fallback, Indiana argues the excessive fines clause cannot be incorporated if it applies to civil in rem forfeitures. We disagree. In considering whether the 14th Amendment incorporates a protection contained in the Bill of Rights, we asked whether the right guaranteed not each and every particular application of the right is fundamental or deeply rooted. Indiana's suggestion to the contrary is inconsistent with the approach we have taken in cases concerning novel applications of rights already deemed incorporated, for example, in the case of Packingham v. North Carolina in 2017. Again, very new cases they're referring to. And they're trying to, I think they're kind of hitting Indiana pretty good here, trying to say, listen, we just made all this discussion up in the last 20 years. Where have you been? They anyway, keep going. We held that the North Carolina statute prohibiting registered sex offenders from ass assessing certain commonplace social media sites, websites, violated the First Amendment right to freedom of speech. In reaching this conclusion, we noted the First Amendment's freedom speech, free speech clause was, quote, applicable to the states under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. We did not, however, inquire whether the Free Speech Clause's application specifically, uh, application specifically to social media websites was fundamental or deeply rooted. That was out of Riley v. California 2014. Holding there, without separately considering incorporation, the state's is warrantless search of digital information stored on cell phones ordinarily violates the Fourth Amendment. Boy, that's a whole study right there. I won't do it because I'm running out of time here. We've got only a little bit left. Wow. Here, 2014, they've answered this, this information, the situation about digital information. I was gonna, not going to be able to get to it, but we have a story or a report where a court finds similarly. So that's probably where they got it in a recent case. Again, you can start tying all these things together where they've come from if you just do it. And again, you wouldn't cite to all this. You just cite for the, the little paragraphs that they're stating that apply to you. Similarly here, the Supreme goes on to say, Supreme Court goes on to say, regardless of whether the ap whether application of the excessive fine clause to civil in rem forfeitures is itself fundamental or deeply rooted, our conclusion that the clause is incorporated remains unchanged. For the reason stated, the judgment of the Indiana Supreme Court is vacated, and the case is remanded for further proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion. And I find this not in thing really interesting. If you think you got to think, I have to think about this long and hard a lot because uh, I keep forgetting really the detail. It, you can't. It, there is a reason why you use the word "not" and "inconsistent" instead of just saying "consistent." And uh, I, I can't go through the analysis. I have to go back and really put myself in the mind frame. It bothers me to see that. But why do you speak in the "not"? Well, in in the legal, they have to actually say it that way because. They don't know, I don't know, I think part of the answer there is that they don't know if it can be consistent if you understand the underlying arbitrary and capricious nature of this whole system either. They're not actually telling us a lie here, they're actually telling us something. But not inconsistent, instead of consistent, it's required here in this in this order, and it puts another constraint upon the Indiana Supreme Court. In other words, the process of review isn't that the Supreme Court has decided they now give the opinion of the law of the land back to the Indiana Supreme Court for further, what did they say, further proceedings, further hearings, to incorporate this decision into their, 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 uh, uh, their response. They then will do that, uh, hopefully, and they'll do it with some faithfulness to the statements, and they will come up with a decision. It me doesn't mean that they're going to reverse their position from before. They're just going to come up with a different answer or better if that state wants to challenge this condition and attempt to say, yeah, states can beat down on people irrespective, no matter what. And so you states' rights people, well, be warned. This is a case that's pretty, like I said, do not do not embrace this without acknowledging that this agrees the states can beat down on you. And I've looked at this 14th Amendment when early on in the 90s and said, but you know, if you don't, you see the states are beating down on us. Why would you embrace that and not have the protection to go say, hey, the 14th constrains you? They're not recognizing a lot of these, these things that are in the federal constitution that we apparently need. 
people were naive enough to believe that their governments that they constitute or institute or, or, or vote on were going to do themselves good. Well, what a na- naivete beyond, beyond uh, ridiculous. Now, now, I guess I have a little bit of time. That was at the end of the decision, folks. Vacated and remanded. Uh, go back and listen. Think about what I've said about they can't. You have a position. They have a position that they said the governments can beat down on you and as the Clean Water Act, but you, they can only beat, beat down on you so much. It's your duty, if you, unless you just want to be the slave to all of it and the, the servant to all the oppression and all the penalty and the exact, a full exaction. They've given you a little bit of pushback that you are required to push back with. This decision gives you the statements, you can copy and paste some of it, we're going to, on certain places, we're going to attach it to a prior condition and right, and a prior a, situ, a, a prior obligation and duty that that is going to bring this into a different, the same protection, but by a different mechanism. We're I'm going to tell, I'm telling you we're going to pro, copy and paste some of this. This is usable right now. This is what we have, my, myself and my colleagues. Well, you, all those that have been listening, listening close, you know how consistent I've been. I'll let you be that decision. I'm going to say I have been absolutely consistent with this uh, when we're dealing with this uh, property law, the real law of the land. This law of the land brings it one step even before this case's decision under the 14th Amendment. And it's completely ob- obstructs the state from imposing. And so, those of you that get what I'm saying and been listening... Start considering that in the in the concepts of what you have to deal with in your life. You'll find, you'll eventually see what I'm saying. I mean, I just don't, this case pretty well wraps a lot of that up. Not everything, certainly, but a lot of it. I can go through other things I have not talked about. Uh, there, there, this case I can open up. I just don't think I had the time. Um, I don't think I have the time now. I still have to read uh, Th- Justice Thomas's concurring judgment. And I'm not sure if I can get through the whole thing, but he says some things. I think I'm going to go ahead and, and not go to the notice in the news, because you hear that all the time. You can go read it for yourself. You'll pick up what you want. You've either decided you want to do, make a, uh, find a wrong to make right or have a wrong you need to make right uh, or not. I don't know what to say about that. Until I'm guided different, I'm just going to do this process. I think I'm going to continue to read this until I run out of time, but which I have a little bit of time here. I might get through it. We'll see. But Justice Thomas takes an interesting uh, a distinction. He comes to the same answer, but the same outcome. But he moves it a little bit differently. And this is a very interesting intake, uh, take on this. Not that it's out of, I mean, not so interesting and unique. It's just that the, you can see the dynamic in the court. That these made decisions really are only opinions. And we our whole lives are structured by them. And this is why this also shows us we should not actually put our rights into their hands to determine. And what I've offered to you now is as I realize it more, and again, it fulfilled itself better in 2013 when I, um, when I, I was in the authorship of the, of the complaint for the equity injunction, but the Jefferson Mining District moved their suit through, and I understood better then the, and now, I mean, as that's where it starts in application now, folks, not just research. What in, what equity does, and you don't bring questions to equity. You bring your rights and your property that's being violated and enjoin or, or mandate somebody to fulfill something or enjoin them from interfering. Rights that are found in your documents, all right? So this is not a question. Uh, that is a process that's a little different. Uh, so you we have to separate out these things, but they speak directly to what's going on here. And I think Justice Thomas starts to bring up more of that, and although he doesn't speak what I'm telling you, when you listen to his distinction, he starts to show that there's an other way to get at it, and I'm suggesting whether or not it's the way I've observed. These opinions really are only opinions. Your rights are what you assert, and if you do them in equity and where you have the proof, and not as a law, a common law action where they have an opinion to put on it, then the issue becomes relative to the paperwork and the facts, not some opinion by a judge, which is common law, or a jury, which is tainted, uh, the best I can see. And I've told you, it's tainted by the fact that they're just commerce selection because they all, I think all states pick through the, either it's the voter registration or the, or the uh, motor vehicle code. That's all commerce. 
the, the voting is a is, is a franchise that's in con that's in that's in uh, co corporate. Yeah. So understand these connections. But let me read that Justice Thomas. We'll go as far as we can. I agree. He says concurring in the judgment, Th Justice Thomas. He's not in. He like he he agrees with the outcome. The, the state doesn't have the right to beat down on Tim's, uh, where the fine is only ten thousand dollars or twelve hundred and three dollars, and take a forty thousand dollar SUV. Because what's the rule? Because it was punitive in nature, and even a slight bit of punitive in nature of uh, exaction is enough to invoke this protection. And to the extent, again, remember, there's an extent to the fact of it's oh, it's interfering with your livelihood, your contentments, your wainage, your uh, your business. Actually, you get into commerce. They say it there. The business is a different, little different application. For, I'll tell you uh, because you have documents that will. Because most people are then now in the tax, in the, their income they're talking about is this tax thing. Uh, they have documents to prove that out, and that can be balanced out. So I don't necessarily believe to go through that. I'd rather go through the livelihood. It's much easier for a producer to do so. And your rights come up from the land. Y'all are producers. Your rights to the highway are the same grant that I'm talking about. There is nothing that they can interfere with you that they won't be affecting your livelihood when they go and exact from you something uh, for, to the state like a parasite under the professed idea that it's for safety and health when in fact you've never been making it on the highway. You see how that works. And so they, now they're directly affecting the right, aren't they? Not, not even just the livelihood from it because you're not making one. They're just using the fundamental right that's deeply rooted, aren't you? <laughs> And so I'm just paraphrasing this court case. I'm not making it up, folks. I'm just, I just copy orally copied and pasted the discussion to you. I hope you heard that. I mean, it's not that hard. But let me get on. I agree with the court, Thomas Justice Thomas. I agree with the court that the Fourteenth Amendment makes Eighth Amendment's prohibition on excessive fines fully applicable to the states. But I cannot agree with the route the court takes to reach this conclusion. Instead of reading the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause to encompass a substantive right that has nothing to do with process, I would hold that the right to be free from excessive fines is, the, is one of the, quote, privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, quote, protected by the 14th Amendment. The 14th. Section 1 here, he goes on. The 14th Amendment provides that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. Quote, on its face, this appears to grant United States citizens a certain collection of rights, i.e. privileges or immunities, attributable to that status, as decided in McDonald in Chicago in 2010. That status, folks, focus on what Tom was saying relative to that. That's what I speak about all the time. All right? Understand these. Just don't get confused. Don't let your eyes roll back. Don't, don't be persuaded against your mind engaging in this. This is not that hard. It's a little bit obscure because we don't put our mind in it. But it's not that hard to understand. I talk about status all the time. It's what I refer to when I find people are kind of railing against stuff, but they, they're really victims of their self-inflicted wound because they didn't address status. They didn't confine it when someone tried to drag that status into something that could be bludgeoned to death like a little baby seal. It's what I speak to stopping at all points. It's what I told you we did in 2013 and knew to look for when I did the quo warranto. I knew what those judges and the clerks were going to do. The Corps War and Toe is the only evidence that we knew that was going to happen. It did, and they couldn't answer. And that makes all the difference in that case for anybody who really wants to apply law. Getting on to this, what Thomas, uh, Justice Thomas says. So he agree, only agree, he says it's correct, but it comes through your privileges and immunities as that status in 1868. What if your rights are before that and higher, folks, is what I've been trying to get at through all these discussions with the land law. Uh, but as I have previously explained, this court marginalized the privileges or immunity clauses in the late 19th century by defining the collection of rights covered by the clause, quote, quite narrowly. The litigants seeking federal protection of substantive rights against the states thus needed, quote, an alternative font of such rights, close quote, and this court, quote, found one in a most curious place. The 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, 
which prohibits any state from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Because this clause speaks only to process, the court has, quote, long struggled to define, close quote, what substantive rights it protects. This is all coming from, Tom, from Thomas speaking in the McDonald case as well. He's been here a while, folks. The court ordinarily says, as it does today, that the clause protects the rights that are, quote, fundamental. Sometimes that means rights that are, quote, deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, close quote. Other times, when the formulation proves too restrictive, the court defines the universe of, quote, fundamental rights so broadly as to border on meaningless. And didn't I earlier bring up the conversation, folks, that when they did this, they bring in the history and traditions. What about your law? What about your grants? What about your rights? What about the things antecedent? All of this. What about your, your unalienable rights? Not the inalienable rights. We're talking about here inalienable rights. Understand that distinction if you haven't put that together and that didn't kind of run through your mind as we're talking. So, Tom, I'm kind of into this thing with Thompson. He's not bringing up what I'm telling you, but he's bringing the same points that I had problems with in this. And he's saying it's right here showing that we're only looking at the, based on this fundamentalism, but it's it's abstract. It's made up as we go. We find that we haven't made a nice def definition so we can attach ourselves, anchor ourselves so real well to that. Because why? We're only addressing the history and traditions. There's a whole lot of other jurisdictions, if I can put it that way, to, to, bow, to bring to the table, if you will. He goes on to say, rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity, as referenced to Planned Parenthood versus Southeastern Pennsylvania at Casey, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence and meaning of the universe and of the mystery of the human life. Because the oxymoronic substantive due process doctrine has no basis in, consti in the Constitution, it is unsurprising that, this, that the court has been unable to adhere to any, quote, guiding principle to distinguish fundamental rights to, that warrant protection from non-fundamental rights that do not. He just said a mouthful, folks, that when I looked at that, I'm telling you, as I said before, yeah, they can beat you down. It's up to you now to push back up against what they can't take. He's saying it in a different context right there. you got fundamental and non-fundamental. Where did they stick you in your status and drop you into non-fundamental so that, or made a record against you that was, it put you in non-fundamental, that you were supposed to make the fundamental assertion? He admits to the court that this substantive due process is an oxymoron. And also he'll explain it's not even the same thing in a way. Like unless substantive is attached to process. Process is how you're served, how you're given notice. All the paperwork shuffling that goes on. Not the rights of the property itself. To add hopefully a little complexion on this if you didn't pick up why this is so important. And, and there's more to discuss. Let me keep going. And because the court's substantive due process precedents allow the court to fashion fundamental rights without any textual constraints, it is equally unsurprising that among these precedents are some of the court's most notoriously incorrect decisions. He references Roe versus Wade and Dred Scott versus Sanford. One was in 1973 and the other in 1857, predating, predating this 1868 law. Understand, I tell you, learn the chronology. You'll understand what this guy starts to talk about. Go, boy, Dred Scott's a study and a half, and the, the, the slaughterhouse cases that come in after that, what a nonsense they read, but you have to read to understand the nonsense. And he's pointing out that this is a problem. We have a real problem in this court. And I'm saying you better point, you better understand those problems, and you have to speak within the way they understand. You have to make a record. I keep saying make a record. You're making the record. When I talk to you, make your record. We're usually talking about the sub, the the, the tangible things of property and title and all that. That's fundamental to the rights that you're advancing, or by some control that you have through a contract or an obligation and duty of government. What they try to do is make non-fundamental rights. They give you, they move you from unalienable or the right to have and then the contract which fundamental right to have to something that they have discretion over. They do that administratively. That's what I'm always talking about is right here what Thomas, uh, Justice Thomas is talking about. I, I'm telling you, make your fundamental 
rights known in the record. Don't let those pass. Don't let them give you get you into some non-fundamental reg, uh, der, uh, constraint that they have the well, the Chevron uh, instance of of the decision making over that. They are given deference for their decision. Don't do that to yourself. Everybody seems to want to do that. I've been all I've been saying all these years is listen to listen to the Justice Thomas here today. He's telling you there's a distinction. I'm telling I've been telling you make sure you make the right record that keeps you on the right side of the fence. And the fence that obstructs the government access. But this reference to Dred Scott, boy, that put on some distant re search and research I was doing in acknowledgement to uh, Ron Steffen's acknowledgement that it, he's doing searching. Well, you are and you aren't, because you're supposed to already know the law, so you're actually researching that out. But understood, the search, you're actually investigating what's actually the reality. And he's telling us today into the Supreme Court purview, and you would actually mention this in your lower issues, in your lower court paper, paper ma making paper for record, you would mention this fact. That don't you would actually? I'd actually call out you're attempting to put my my not my fundamental rights into a non fundamental category so that you can violate them. That's a felony. That's how I would say that, folks. He, here's your authority for it if you needed it. But you've heard me say this all before, so it's uh, to me it's just confirmation, folks, of what's out there for us. Here we go. Keep going. The present case illustrates the incongruity of the court's due process approach to incorporating fundamental rights against the states. Petitioner, this is Tim's, argues that the forfeiture of his vehicle is an excess punishment. He does not argue that the Indiana courts failed to, quote, proceed according to the law of the land. That is, according to the written constitutional statutory requirements, or that the state failed to provide some baseline procedures, right, process, the proceedings, that he claim, his claim has nothing to do with any process due him. I, I therefore decline to apply the legal fiction of substantive due process. So every time you see this thing they call substantive due process, every time I read it, I just got to shake my head and go, what? this is a legal fiction. He admits to that here. Right? He's telling the court. This is, we're going, I agree with the outcome, but we've been going down the wrong path, and that's been causing some trouble. And boy, hasn't it. But you have to go look. If it's causing trouble, then it's political. Because what did Roe versus Wade actually do but say that we're going to now institute an industry for the use of aborted baby parts, didn't it? And so there's another thing going on here as well. Again, you can open up your mind to lots of things. Depends on what you're capable of or willing to see and put again as a possibility and probability, depending on how much evidence you can get for in favor of a certain well, hypothesis, I suppose, theory, whatever, however you want to organize your mind. Uh, going on, set, set chapter two here on his decision, or his, uh, his, uh, his opinion, uh, when the, the 14th Amendment was ratified, quote, the terms privileges and immunities had an established meaning as synonymous to right. And you're going to have to figure out the context between that word, between two different words being used. Notwithstanding, he doesn't do that here. Let's go. Those rights were the inalienable rights of citizens. Does he use the word unalienable here, folks? No, these were bestowed rights, weren't they? So they're inalienable. This is careful on how you run this thing through, but very instructive right here on what the distinction is. Those rights were inalienable rights of citizens that had been long recognized and the ratifying public understood the privileges or immunity clause to protect the constitutionally enumerated rights against interference by the states. Many of these rights had been adopted from English law into colonial charters, then state constitutions and Bill of Rights, and finally the Constitution. Quote, Consistent with their English heritage, the founding generation generally did not consider many of the rights identified in the Bill of Rights as a new entitlement, but as an inalienable rights of all men given legal effect by their codification in the constitutional context. In the constitutional context is inalienable. All that before was what? That was the Declaration of Independence, recognizing uh, the rights of men and un antecedent, unalienable. Not a civil imposition. The imposition, folks. The civil constraint. Civil. 
right? The question here is whether the Eighth Amendment's prohibition, he goes on uh, to say, the question here is whether the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on excessive fines was considered such a right. The historic the historical record overwhelmingly demonstrates that it was. He's saying, no, it's through your privileges and immunities that the state still can't interfere with. And so he concurs. And I think that was the end of that. No, maybe not. So that was, the, I guess, for him, he's, he's actually, and he's going to go on to say here more, and I do have a little bit more here to say, I guess, quite a bit. He goes on and on uh, about in, uh, in a different way, as you can also already hear. And uh, more consistent with what I've been telling you has to happen, and that's because I've been trying to focus you on your fundamental nature of the rights and your and your properties and all that, instead of allowing a, an agency, a, a government, a local government, a county, to move you into the non-fundamental side. That's what your contested cases are over, non-fundamental. That's why the authority of a non-contested a contested case hearings officer does not rise up in order to affect anything that's actually tangible within rights to you, but something the state issues. And the courts are also limited. They cannot, there's no adjudication that can be made, no issue that can be made on something that Congress has patented. That's treaties to the private people, which are actually a, a federal Article Three vindication if they get encroached upon. And going on, the excessive fine laws, subsection A here, was taken verbatim from the English Bill of Rights in 1689. How long standing here, folks? This is out of the case of the Bajakajian case of 1998, which itself formalized a long-standing English prohibition on disproportionate fines. The Charter of Liberties of Henry I issued in 1101. That's another interesting date, but anyway, a time, not date, but a time stated that, uh, this is about 12, before 1213, I guess is the point there, issued, a one, uh, 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 issued in 1101, stated that, quote, if any of my barons or men should have committed an offense, sh he shall not give security to the extent of the forfeiture of his money, as he did in the time of my father or of my brother, but according to the measure of the offense, so, she, so shall he pay. Let me make a distinction that's been made about that. This was to the barons. The peons, the peasants were not the barons, but they're moving on. They're extending this to everyone now here, unless they extend it because you're all peons, peasants. Moving on. This is why I try to get ahead of the 1868 stuff and put us into 1866 law of the land. Expanding this principle, Magna Carta required that immersements, the medieval predecessor to fines, should be proportioned to the offense and that they should not deprive a wrongdoer of his livelihood. Now, you take a pick away from a man, you take a, 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 a mining uh, vehicle away from a man that's a miner, aren't you affecting that? So that anybody, a miner is out there working and they want to steal his property and put him in jail for that, that's a crime here, isn't it? It's a government a government a wrong, a violation of the Constitution, if, if we are going to assert any such thing at all. And I just say, if you don't, if you just kind of give it lip service, then what are you around for? I mean, I mean, you really, you can't stay inside the border anymore. To, to, you got to go find that island that you've been seeking, I, I suppose. And then I'll just say, the reality of the world will, one day someone comes knocking on your door. No matter what, what you think and what your laws might be on your island, um, that can be taken from you at any time by whatever method. But anyway, going on, the livelihood, wrongdoer of this livelihood, and then he references the Bajakjian case, uh, quote, a free man, not hyphenated here, a free man shall be immersed from a small fault only according to the measure thereof and for a great crime according to its magnitude, saving his position. And in like manner, a merchant saving his trade. And in a villain, saving his tillage. He should not fall under our mercy. Capital O here. Magna Carta, Howard Magna Carta text and commentary, 1998. Understand all the references to recent times here, folks. Similarly, clauses leveling immersements only in the proportion to the measure of the offense applied to earls, barons, and clergymen. One historian posits that due to the prevalence of immersements and their use in increasing the English treasury, 
quote, very likely there was no clause in the Magna Carta more grateful to the mass of the people than that about immersement. Please the Crown and the County in Gloucester. Let me advise here, or maybe not advise, but remind you that the barons and the clergy and the earls, they were all lords, and they all had peasants. And those peasants would be in contract with them for their tillage, remember. So there, be careful here on the application as well. They were getting something what they called rents. They were receiving something from which the crown would penalize them if they had been wrong, done wrong. So where does the peasant get his? It becomes the interesting problem. I will equate that to even the production because he gets his from the toil of the ground and there is no tax on that. There's no penalty that can be, that cannot affect that. Now, I'll, I'll end, there's a lot more to say that. I'll end there. I'll let you folks do this research because it's, if you just do some historic research, you'll, all these things come to mind. They come to my mind. It's what I keep pressing on. It's what I press with. It's what I hope you've appreciated and those that have taken on the information that have helped you. This is where some of the basis of all this sits. The principle was reiterated in the first statute of Westminster, which provided that no man shall, quote, be immersed without reasonable cause and according to the quantity of his trespass. Wow, what if the government's the trespasser? That's pretty fascinating, isn't it? The court, English courts had long enforced this principle. In one early case, for example, the king commanded the bailiff, that's a bailee, got to go read those, those are a UCC, I think I'll pop with those, quote, uh, quote to, to make a moderate immersement proper to the magnitude and manner of the offense, according to the tenor of the Great Charter of Liberties of England, and the bailiff was sued for extorting a heavier ransom. The bailiff, folks. <laughs> you didn't think you had rights against people. At any rate, let's, I go, uh, there's still a few more pages. I didn't get to the end. He eventually, uh, you know, he's just building the case in history about why we have what we have today. He brings it through the your privileges and immunities instead of due process. And I have to say, his observations better there because, in fact, there was no process that was argued not bestowed. For me, I would be arguing that as well. We've come in and said, you don't have the right to be doing that, so there's no process you can give me, as well as you can't come after the property, for these very reasons. So if you can see, it's not one or the other. I would use them both, what's acknowledged by both sides of the court in coming to the decision. But if you understand what I've said and the foundation for it, you'll understand why I can do that, and it's within both of their opinions. It's all I'm saying is you understand how you get both of them, and they can't, you've wrapped them up. They can't, there's no denial to be made with how they've decided. They literally have to start overthrowing their private previous decisions. And like I said, this, this case, when you see it's going after livelihood, when the miners didn't get a remedy and they were dismissed to certiorari just a, a week ago or so, they essentially, the Supreme Court violated this decision themselves. I would have to ask as a question, didn't they? I shouldn't have to ask, but I ask it just so, just to put it out there, let you think about it. So, uh, that's enough. You can read the rest of it. I think enough I've said here gives you an idea. I hope it does. I hope it shows how we, how I quickly go through working with this information, how we, uh, again, I was thankful to the, uh, my colleague for actually putting out, because I don't have the time to read all this stuff, and unless it's called to my attention, sometimes we don't. Uh, well, I don't read it. And, uh, then again, he read certain importances, and I read a whole bunch of others. And so we've been able to now work together. Again, working together now. So he could see his, I saw mine, we put ours together. We're going to have a much more formidable position, just like you could. Thank you for uh, listening today. Uh, uh, thank you, Grimner, for what you do. Uh, uh, behind, uh, uh, for Behind the Witch at reallibertymedia.com. And uh, anybody uh, uh, like Jules over at ucy.tv and your uh, syndication, appreciate all that. Everybody that's rebroadcasting and whatever you're doing to re. Uh, to get the word out, folks, is just uh, us stepping up. I think these are the foundation today. Or in this case, it's going to be a short a short broadcaster entry because it's just this document, but maybe you appreciate that in the discussion. Uh, I'll be with you next week. Tech Diffs or Nature Will. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, 
Journey with Purpose. A can of whoop ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass. <laughs>